got a question. All right, shh, shh, listen to this. Recently, the United States women's soccer team, winner of four women's World Cups, I think. So probably the most dominant team in a sport, maybe in history. I don't know. Like, like he yeah, had no, because like I think there's been some countries in the men's side that have won like five World Cups, but still, like since the women's world cup's been around a lot shorter amount of time, they've really dominated the sport, the United States women's football team. Okay. Football for you. Okay. Um, football. Um, anyway, the, the issue is the women who play for the U S women's national team. If, uh, if they go play at a world cup, they'll get paid something like, $9,600 for each game they, or it's, it's less than that, but it's like, I'd have to look up the actual numbers. They get paid like, say like $9,600 for each game that they win. And if a man goes, they get paid something like 100,000 for each game that they win. And so the women sued the United States Soccer Federation saying, we do the same work, we should get the same pay. Under U.S. law, same work, same pay. If you and I both work as clerks at a grocery store, then we should be paid the same unless one of us is getting paid more on the basis of seniority, like I've been there longer, or merit, like, you know, you've gotten a raise because you're just better at the job or something. But mostly it's same, same work, same pay. Yes. Have the men won? They've never won a World Cup. Okay, so there's there's one viewpoint, right? Here's another consideration though. If um if a if a nation's men's team wins the World Cup, then FIFA, that's the international governing body of, of football and soccer, they'll pay a massive amount of money to that team. Like the like FIFA makes like like billions of dollars on the men's World Cup. So therefore the purse, the prize money is in hundreds of millions. Okay. And so even if you get like like fourth place at the men's world cup, you'll get more money than what the winner of the women's world cup will get. Because the women's world cup will only generate like $300 million in revenue. And the men's world cup will generate like five or $6 billion in revenue. And remember that a billion is a thousand orders, you know, a thousand times greater than a million. So in other words, just because of viewership and sponsorship and what they can sell the ads for the men's world cup tournament makes a ton more money than the women's world cup tournament. Therefore, the governing body gives much higher prizes for the men's tournament than they do for the women's tournament, just based on their revenue. In essence, it's a share of revenue. And so the argument of the United States Soccer Federation, at first, at least, was, well, but what we pay them is based on what we get. So even if our men just make it to the World Cup and then they get eliminated in the, in the group stages, we're going to get paid more from FIFA than if our women, like, you know, get to the, the third round. And if our men make it to the round of 16, we're going to get more than even if our women win the Women's World Cup because there's just so much more money in the men's game. Similar to like the NBA, right? WNBA players make a lot less than NBA players, mostly because there's much more money to be had. The TV rights sell for a whole lot more, all of those things. So we have all these considerations, right? Should a person's pay be based on the amount of revenue they can generate, or should it be based on, based on the work that they do, or should it be some combination of those two factors? What do you think? What do you mean by advertise the same? Uh-huh. 
Ajá. Um, yeah, I, I would say in the past, it's been less, but it's been growing. In other words, the women's game's getting more attention and there's more advertising going into it. But it, it, have you ever watched like women's like basketball? Or do you watch any sports? Women's versions of games are often slower and less exciting to watch. At least that's what a lot of fans say. Men's volleyball versus women's volleyball, even like, you know, it's although I like softball and baseball almost equally well because I think they've made some adjustments to the games that make them slightly different. Not that terrible to watch. I, I think baseball is not that fun to watch, though, too. So it's right. I like to play. Anyway, so what are the considerations that should go into what's fair? So what happened, the, the resolution of this is that, that uh, the women, so the, the United States Soccer Federation has the U.S. men's national team, the U.S. women's national team, and then there's all these tiers beneath it, like the like there's the pro side, major league soccer. And then there's like the, the, the youth national teams, Paralympic national teams. But what happened is the men's national team and the women's national team had both signed collective bargaining agreements with the United States Soccer Federation. So their lawyers had met with the Soccer Federation and agreed to terms on how they would be paid. So when the women took it to court, the judge said, well, this is the collective bargaining agreement. You, you agreed to be paid this way. You, you signed on to this as members of the collective bargaining agreement. So even if you're getting paid less, you agreed to these terms. And the men agreed to their terms. So they dismissed their case and said, if you want to get better pay, you need to renegotiate with, with the Stock Federation. You can't agree to a contract and then say, well, that's not fair. And the judge found that when he calculated it, the women were actually making more than the men because they were winning a lot more, right? But what they were saying is, but if we won the same, we'd be getting paid less than men. And so what they ended up doing is renegotiating the terms. They made a single contract for all players of the national teams. Um, and that's how they resolved it. They did it out of court. They, you know, they readdressed it. But now they're dependent upon, you know, the men to win enough to generate the revenue that the soccer federation can afford to pay the women. So in essence, they're going to take a loss on the women's team. And so they have to make enough profit on the men's team to, to balance that. You can even see that here at the college level. Okay. Um, you know, you can go watch women's basketball or men's basketball, and there'll be a difference in the attendance. Usually not so much at junior college level, because we just go out and watch whatever games being played. But, you know, if we're going to like NCAA Division I, the men's soccer coach, or, I mean, the men's uh, basketball coach will get paid. What do you think an NCAA Division I men's basketball coach gets paid? Three to seven million dollars a year. They're usually the highest paid person at, at the college. They make more than the college president or, or the football coach, one of those two. Right, but they bring in tons and tons of revenue, right? Because they, they fill stadiums of 50,000 people. And who wants to buy somebody's merchandise unless they're a good team, right? Whereas women's coaches make significantly less. So you could argue, on the one hand, they should be paid the same because they do the same pay. On the other hand, they're paid, they're paid based on the amount of revenue they generate. Why does a movie star get paid more than me? Because they generate a lot more revenue than I do. Well, that's nice. So maybe I should get paid what Hugh Jackman gets paid because I'm at least as sexy as him. At least. I mean, I'm a little chunkier, but... All right. So the way the United States legal system has gone as it relates to employee welfare is they've pretty much tried to move away from common law resolutions to disputes between employers and employees, and instead try to have statutes 
that cover all of the ways employees should be treated. Remember, we have both of those in our system, common law, which is past court precedent, and then statutes, which spell out the way the law is. So they've created statutes to deal with all of these things about how employees should be treated. So the first statute is what's called the workers' compensation statutes. Those came out in the 1900s. Anybody ever heard of work, workers' compensation? Used to be called workmen's comp, but that's uh, sexist. So we don't say that anymore. Here's the idea. If you're injured in the scope of employment, you have some coverage so that you can continue to get paid while you're recovering from your injury. And it doesn't matter whose fault it is. So even if you, you do something stupid at work and you get hurt, you know, you're, you're putting shingles into a roof with a nail gun and, and nail your foot or something. Yeah, it's happened. You ever use one of those nail guns? You ever watch the guys that are good at it? Bah, 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 bah. Boom, boom, boom. They go fast because they're trying to get houses built, right? You go boom, boom, boom. Oh, sorry to your friend standing next to you. What's that? Okay. So, <laughs> well, I was making sure I heard her. Sorry. Um, so just know that, that we have laws that say if you're injured on the job, you'll be covered and you'll be able to get some pay while you're recovering, okay? So that's workers' compensation. There's a whole bunch more slides, but we won't go through all of them. Um, but again, the main principle, employees do not have the right of common lawsuit. Instead, they just file for benefits under this. Um, and so typically we, you see third parties can be sued to indemnify employers. So that means if there's somebody else at fault, the employer can sue, but the employer still has to pay the workman's comp, okay? And usually employers buy workman's compensation or workers' compensation insurance so that if something happens, they're not trying to pay out of their pocket for you to get this care. The insurance pays for you. Most states require it or they require you to have this big fund of money to self-insure yourself, okay? The second one is the Social Security Act. So in essence, 7.65% of what you get paid and you get paid and you get paid. Not you guys, you can't get money here right now. That stinks. Wouldn't it be nice if you could, can you, you can work at the, there on campus, right? Do you, you still work in there? No, but you did for a while, right? No? Was Tino working in there? Maybe, that, maybe that's what I was thinking of. Anyway, 7.65% of the money you make is withheld from your paycheck and put into the social security fund. Another 1.35 goes into Medicare and then your employer has to match it. They have to pay an additional 7.65% over what you earn and 1.35. And all of that goes into this fund. And when you retire, you will have some basic social security benefit. This is why a lot of people get mad when the government tries to act like social security is welfare because they're like, no, this is a program we paid into our whole lives. You held out almost 8% of my, well, over 8% of my pay. And so right now, if you have like full benefits, you'll get paid something like $1,000 a month in retirement. So it's not enough to live off of, like it's not a full retirement, but it's meant to give somebody at least some basic amount so that they're not like starving to death, right? But I'll tell you, like for me, who I've got like I've I've got some savings and I know that I'll have oh, probably six thousand dollars a month in retirement, knowing that I'll get another thousand in social security. Well, that's not bad, right? Then that's that's birthday presents for all my grandkids. Uh when you have a lot of grandkids, it gets expensive. I have eight kids. I'll probably have like 30 grandkids. Gee. Do I spend a hundred bucks on each one's birthday? That's three grand. Not really. Not for when they're little, but like for a teenager. What can I get you? What can I buy you for under a hundred dollars? That would be awesome to you. Uh, 
All right. Yeah, well, I usually plan about 100 for birthdays and 100 for Christmas. But it gets expensive when you have eight kids, they get married, so now you have their spouses, and then they have children, right? I don't spend 100 on the little ones because they're happy with any little thing. Anyway, so that's what Social Security is is just it's it's a system in which we pay in and it pays us some amount in retirement okay all right flsa is the fair labor standards act it covers things like minimum wage child labor restrictions and overtime pay um so just so you know the federal minimum wage is the lowest it can go meaning a state can't pay, can't have a minimum wage that's less than the federal minimum wage. But a state can have a higher minimum wage. So, you know, a state could say $15 an hour when another state, what is it in Arizona right now? $13.85? I thought it was over 13 now. It's 13 or it's... so. So a lot of times people call FLSA the minimum wage law. It sets a federal minimum wage. And it requires all employees have to be paid minimum wage. And that if you work anything over 40 hours per week, you have to get paid one and a half times your base wage. Okay. So if my base wage is $20 an hour and I work 50 hours in a week, then I'll get 40 hours at my base pay plus 10 hours at time and a half. So if it's 20 an hour, then it'd be $30 an hour for those. So some employers have have different um, rules for this, but this is the minimum rule. So recognize that when the federal government makes a law, states can add to it and say, no, employers in this state are going to pay people better. Like some states require any hours worked over eight in a day to be paid time and a half. So like for some states like Arizona that goes by the federal, if I worked four 10 hour days in a week, then I would just get paid straight time. But in other states, if I worked four tens, I would get 36 hours or 32 hours of straight time and eight hours of overtime, right? But just know the federal standard is anything over 40 hours a week. You could work 12 hour days, they don't care. It's just 40 hours a week. And then child labor laws, let's see, an eight, Someone over the age of 18 can work any job. 16 and 17 year olds cannot work in hazardous jobs. That's the law. So the mine can't hire high school kids for like summer work. A mine is considered hazardous, but they do hire college kids. If any of you are looking for jobs this summer, you drive truck up there, I think they pay you 26 bucks an hour, drive the water truck, pretty good. Uh huh. Was it 19? Is that all? What's that? It's a 20. Okay. Have you done it? You didn't like it. I've heard that's what you do is you go fill up with water and they tell you where to go and you go there and then they tell you turn on your water and then you drive back and forth to spray water until it's empty and then you drive back and fill up with water again for 12 hours but in those 12 hours you made <laughs> so you're like i'm making is it 40 hour weeks okay but they're 12. But still you're making you're making 800 bucks a week or which is nice if you're a poor college kid all right he's like sign me up all right anyway 14 and 50 year olds can only work during non-school hours and there's a limit to the number of hours they can work so that's how the federal law is states can be more restrictive but they can't be less restrictive okay so that's flsa fair labor standards act minimum wage and overtime rules and child labor rules. The Equal Pay Act, this is the one we were just talking about. It is illegal to pay different wages to men and women doing the same job. 
So women's soccer's argument was, we do the same job as them. We play soccer, they play soccer. That was their argument. Seems like a fair argument. But the counter argument, which is, but your playing of soccer generates way less money than their playing soccer is an interesting one, especially in certain fields like acting and performance things like sports and other things, right? Because now it's like, well, how do we deal with this? What they did is they found a, a solution just by settling, by all agreeing to certain terms and that worked good for them. But it does bring up some interesting questions, right? I'll, I'll give you an example. In our department here, we have seven full-time faculty, four are men, three are women. Until recently, all of the men made more than all of the women. And we were asking ourselves, what's going on with this? Is our system flawed? Because our system is laid out fairly. In essence, you get paid a base salary if you're a, if you're a faculty member, and then you get raises anytime you earn five credits beyond your master's degree toward your PhD. And then it, it maxes out at having a PhD, a doctorate degree. You also earn a raise every year you work up to 10 years. And then if you have a PhD or a master's plus 60 credits, you can go another five years, up to 15 years of, of raises. So anybody can do that, right? Man or woman can earn more education and can stay here longer. But what was happening was most of our women were choosing to raise families instead of go back to school and get that PhD. And most of our men were going back to school and getting those, those credits beyond their masters and getting their PhD. So it turned out that most of our men were making more than most of our women doing the same work. But longevity is an exception to that rule, right? If you've been there longer and merit. And in the case of education, can we say getting further education in your field is a form of merit that you could be paid for? Probably. So what do you think? Do you think that that system unfairly treats women or do you think it's reasonable and the reason the women were being paid less was because of their own choices? What are your thoughts? Somebody have a thought? Casey, you at least nodded. Can you? But what if she says, that's unfair because I have children to raise? So you don't think that's a valid, like like raising children and how you structure the raising of children and stuff in the home is kind of a personal choice. And anybody want to go counter to that? No, nah, you guys. Our community is just too conservative. We need more liberal people to spice up the conversations. Everybody's like, yeah, well, you just choose it and you're good. But would you say that like societally, we do have sort of an expectation. If mom and dad both work and a kid gets sick at school, that typically we would expect it would be mom that would like take off work to take care of the kid. Probably like it's a cultural norm for us. Do you think it's the same where you grew up? Yeah. Still like mom's still kind of ultimately responsible for the care of the family. Um, mom and dad both work. Probably mom still bears more of the homekeeping part of, of, you know, not that dad, you know, in our family, I, I do the dishes and I make dinner probably more than half the time, but still there's sort of this mindset, probably not fair that like by doing the dishes, I'm helping out my wife with her duty of caring for the home. And like, you know, we've had these conversations instead of just saying, no, we all have an equal duty to care for the home. Um, there's still that, that, that mindset still lingers from just culturally for us. Uh, or like when I, you know, dads are helping take care of the kids instead of like, no, they're your kids. You're taking care of your kids. 
like who was it? I used to have a sister-in-law that would get really bent out of shape whenever her husband would call watching their children babysitting. Cause she'd be like, uh, no, you're what you're spending time with your children. Whoa. Okay. But so we do have that cultural expectation that can make those things challenging. Um, whoops. God damn it. Just a couple more guys. Stay with me. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act. So those are laws relating to safety in the workplace. Uh, and then there's specialized versions of it like MSHA, which is like the Mine Safety and Health Act because mines are considered hazardous places. They have even more rules. But these are all the rules that explain what's allowed and what's not allowed. Like even like if, if you are a roofer, you're required under OSHA to run a line that your employees can hook onto. So if they fall, they won't fall off the house, right? Those types of things, making sure your safety equipment is approved, making sure if someone's going to be working out near a road, they have a reflective vest on, you know, stuff like that, right? Minimizing injuries and deaths. Um, and we still have workplace accidents. It's actually a fairly high in the ranking of things where people get killed. They get killed in workplace injuries. Um, but way less than it used to be. Like even our mine, they still have injuries up there, but it's it's fairly rare that we have a fatality up there at the mine. And it's a pretty dangerous place, even for a water truck driver. Is it? No? Are you ever driving in the vicinity of the big haul trucks? Oh, really? The water trucks are that big? I didn't know they're that big. I thought they were. Has anybody, have you ever, any of you ever seen one of the haul trucks they drive up at the mine? Like, like I don't come, I don't come halfway on the wheel. So the, the wheel is like two of me tall. It's like 13 feet tall. The bed of the truck will hold an entire house in it. Like that's how big it is. They're massive. And so they've had accidents up there, like where they just drive over a normal pickup truck in it. Boom, bump. Feels like a bump. Because uh, there's these huge trucks. Okay. I didn't realize that. And their tires cost like $30,000 a piece. So they're like, if you pop a tire, you're fired. Did you? All right. The Employee Retirement Income Security Act, E-R-I-S-A, okay? This has to do with companies making sure they have to, they had to fund their, their retirement pensions to a higher amount. What was happening is these companies would pay into a pension fund for their employees. Then the company would go out of business and they'd start to steal money back out of the pension fund. Then they go out of business and the employee who's been putting money into the pension fund this whole time has nothing. So they made a law to tighten that up. And so there has to be a certain amount on kind of like a, a bank, a certain amount on deposit at any given time to ensure that people can draw from their pension funds. I know this isn't very exciting because it's just a bunch of laws. That's why I'm trying to kind of get through it quick. Family Medical Leave Act. So this is like if someone gets injured or if a woman is pregnant and has a baby, their job is protected. You can't fire someone for having a baby. You can't fire someone for being injured, um, at least for a window of time. So there's like this window of protection. So I think it's six weeks after a woman has a baby then the employer can say, okay, it's time for you to come back to work. And at that point, if she's like, no, I don't want to come back yet, then it's down to a negotiation, right? Like maybe she could say, I, I just need to, you know, my child had special needs and I'm going to need, you know, four extra weeks to get this baby ready to go to daycare or something. Um, but the employer can terminate you after that six weeks, but they can't during the six weeks. Same thing with an injury. They can say, you know, if, if it continues past a certain amount of time, they can terminate you. This also is where COBRA comes from. Anybody ever heard of COBRA? 
which is like where your insurance benefits and stuff with the company are protected for 90 days beyond you getting fired so that it gives you time to find a new job and get insurance and you still have coverage. That all comes from FMLA, the Family Medical and Leave Act. That's really loud. Pension Protection Act is very much like ERISA. Um, you can see it's even in the same code, 29 of the US code. So same idea, it just it's an amendment to ERISA that requires even higher funding levels um, for pension plans. And finally, the Patient Afford Protection and Affordable Care Act, that's rules about what employers have to offer in given circumstances for health insurance. The big change of that, so that Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, that's the one called Obamacare. Remember when that was all in the news? Um, there's actually been some pretty th good things in that. Maybe they're good. They've become expensive, but for like you guys, all of you, because you're the oldest one in here, we figured that out. You are still covered under your parents' health insurance until you're 26. Okay. And so that ends up costing a lot of money, but also the nice part is if you're off at college, you're you're still covered if, you're, if your parents have insurance. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about how healthcare should be paid for and is doing it through our employers the best way to do it? Is there some better way? But a lot of people are really resistant to the federal government doing it, right? And so we're still in this middle place. Do you know, is there free healthcare in Mexico? Like if you go to the doctor, do you have to pay? Yes. Okay, so it's to employers. Okay, whereas if Pablo was here, he could tell us in Spain, they have socialized medicine. So it's all paid for through the government. So you don't pay for it, it's part of your taxes, but just know their tax rates are way higher, right? Instead of the 24% or so we pay here, they're paying like 55%. So like half of your paycheck goes to the government, but then if you have to go to the hospital, what's hard about that though, is then if you want to get like an elective procedure done, you got to like, you have to like try to get an approval through government and you know how that goes. They have the same challenges in Canada. A lot of Canadians actually come to the US for elective procedures because they get put on these huge waiting lists up there. So I don't know, I don't know the solution. I think our solution leaves some people out in the cold, especially people who are underemployed or, or and, but I think their solution also has its own challenges, like the government kind of saying, you don't need that. And you're like, but I want that, right? Anyway, so that's it. I, the really important thing I, I want you to kind of pull away from this chapter is number one, employee welfare, the caring for of employees is something that our country, United States, has a really checkered history with. I mean, if you look back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was a bad time to be an employee. It was kind of this mindset of like you were owned by your employer and they could do what they want with you. And, and there was a lot of abuses and a lot of um, just, it was, a, it was tough. And so the formation of labor unions and the formation of these federal statutes came about to protect employees and that where there's always this constant sort of struggle between the, the employer's need, right? Like the costs of doing all these things can get high and the employee's needs, and we're trying to find that balance. And if you look at a lot of the differences between say, what we would call liberal and conservative policies, a lot of times they, they are involved in these things. Um, in other words, oftentimes more conservative politicians support more rights for the employer more protections for the employer and more liberal politicians support more protections for the, for the workers. And probably where we are right now has a fair degree of balance. It's not a bad place to work in the United States, but uh, not perfect either. Um, anyway, so that's it. So hopefully that wasn't that painful, but I hope you have a great weekend. The exam is all fixed finally, so you can take it and it's open till Wednesday. So you can take it anytime between now and Wednesday.
All right. Have a great day.